Joshua, I'm reading from the 14th chapter, if you have your Bible. I started this message in South Bend, and they wouldn't let me finish it. I never did get to this. But now I'm going to get to it and try to wipe it out tonight. You ready for it? Listen carefully. This will be an encouragement to every one of you, I'm sure. Chapter 14 of Joshua, listen as I read it. Then the children of Judah, verse number 6, I will begin. Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said, excuse me, unto Moses, the man of God concerning me and thee. He's talking to Joshua. In Kadesh Barnea, that was 45 years ago. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea, to espy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly, W-H-O-L-Y, I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance, and thy children's inheritance forever. Not for two weeks, not for a generation, but forever. And that's why all that trouble's going on over there at Holy Land. Because people don't like the Word of God. Now listen as I go on. Forever. Now behold, the Lord hath kept me alive. This is Caleb talking. Talking to Joshua. The Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these forty and five years. Even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old, eighty-five. And yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. And I, as my strength was then, even so is my strength now. Not for the nursing home. Not for the old age pension. But I'm just as strong today as my strength was then, so is my strength now for war. Everybody say war. war. The devil's in trouble when you can get an 85-year-old to talk like this. For war, both to go out and to come in. Now therefore give me this mountain, whereof the Lord spake in that day, for thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there. And that the cities were great, and they were fenced. If so be the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. I love this kind of faith. And Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb the son of Jephunneh, Hebron, for an inheritance. Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite, this day, because that he 
holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy followed the Lord God of Israel. Bow your hearts and let's pray. Father, we thank you for the reading of the Holy Scriptures. And I pray that the anointing of the Holy Spirit will mantle not only your servant tonight, but mantle everyone in divine presence with that anointing. And let the anointing destroy the yoke. Holy Spirit, this is your meeting. Let the word fall on good ground and let it bring forth fruit. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen and amen. I am reading from the 14th chapter of Joshua, and my text will be verse number 10. And now behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said these 45 years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now I am this day fourscore and five years old. Eighty-five. I get anybody here eighty-five? We get sixty-five and we want to quit. This man, eighty-five years of age, never made the Hall of Fame chapter, the eleventh chapter of Hebrews. His name is not in it. But here's an 85-year-old man asking Joshua for a mountain. This is my kind of man. And I believe that you and I in this final day, if we can find the fountain of youth that Caleb find, we'll tread on scorpions and serpents. And instead of running from the devil, we're going to turn around and run after him. And one of us shall chase a thousand, and two of us put ten thousand to flight. Now, I don't mind telling you this is a complete picture of a story of an ideal old age showing you and me an actual instance in his own personal life how happy, how vigorous, full of energy, and an appetite for conflict that a devout old age may be. God has kept him alive for warfare. Hallelujah. For conflict. Paul, writing to the church at Ephesus in the New Testament, I'll bring it over to the New Testament. He says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and wicked spirits in high places. He said, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you might be able to stand against the wiles or the strategy of the devil. He said, Put on the helmet of salvation. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Have your loins girt about with truth and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, but above all, here it comes, above all, take the shield of faith. For with that shield of faith, you shall be able to quench all. Everybody say all. All the fiery darts of the wicked one. And having done all, you'll be able to stand. This is not the time for giving up. But it's the time for standing ground. The devil has knocked you down. He's stolen from you. Your back is against the wall. Many of you don't have any hope. Some of you lost your job. You lost your spouse. Your family has fallen apart. But I've come to encourage you, you that are listening to this radio broadcast, it ain't over yet. I said it ain't over yet. God 
God's going to bring you out of this mess and you're going to get the devil off of your back. You're going to get him out of your head. You're going to get him out of your chest. You're going to get him out of your legs and your feet. You're going to get him out of your family. You're going to get him off the job. You're going to get him out of your pocketbook. Hey! Instead of running from the devil. I'm tired of hearing the church say, Pray for me. That devil's after me again. Why don't you stop and turn around and eyeball that thing? And say, devil, this is it. You can't come any further. God's anointed me to put you where you belong. You ain't got no business in my family. You got no business in my back. There's only one place you have any right to be, and that's under my feet. My elder brother destroyed you 2,000 years ago, and he's given me power over you, and victory is mine. Hallelujah! Ooh, I feel this all over me, folks. Devil said, I wouldn't go preach no more. I'm preaching now. I think the preacher's come. I feel the anointing of God on me. I'm going to put the devil under my feet where he belongs. Can you shout amen? amen? Your day has just begun. The victory is yours. It's already been won. 2,000 years ago, Jesus destroyed the devil and defeated him. But it's up to you and me to enforce. I said it's up to you and me to enforce what's been accomplished 2,000 years ago. We heard the testimony of a young brother, how he was badly beaten by the gang bangers here in Chicago. You can say, well, how can you say the devil's defeated when that's going on? People dying with age, drug addicts are in bondage. People are being held up, shot, drive-by shootings. How can the world, how in the world can you say that the devil was stripped of his power when you read all this going on in the newspaper? You haven't read the rest of the story. That's why God called us to preach. To let the world know the devil ain't got no business messing with the child of God. You've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You've been washed in His blood. Your sins are gone. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And God's given you and me power over all the power of the devil. And I've come to tell you, you can back him up. Put him where he belongs. That devil starts messing with you. That's when God starts blessing pretty good saying. When the devil starts messing, God starts blessing. If you're a child of God, some of you are going through hell. You know what that means? That means God's getting ready to use you. <laughs> I said God's getting ready to use you. This ain't no time for giving up. This is why God saved you. The devil can see what God's going to do and in your life and he's going to use you and he's going to try to stop you in your tracks. He'll put a heart attack on you. He'll try to destroy you. He'll try to kill you with a cancer. But God's got to call on your life. And you're going to finish the work that God called you to do. Can you shout amen? Get ready for your blessing. Get ready for your miracle. Hallelujah. There's something out in front of Caleb. He said, now therefore, give me this mouth. God gave me this promise. 45 years ago. I tell you folks, you may not get it right away, but it's on the way. The devil's trying to hold up your blessing, but it's your miracle. Don't give up. Hang in there. Hold on. Your day has come. Victory shall be mine if I hold my peace and let the Lord fight my battle. Victory! Victory shall be mine! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Are you ready for your miracle? Are you ready to come out of that distress? Are you ready to come out of that sickness? That disease and that infirmity? Then put the devil where it belongs and glorify God. Raise your hands and shout praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 
Sit down. I ain't done. You ain't shouting me down. It's been a long time since I've been to Chicago. I'm going to take my time. Hallelujah. I had a little lady come in our church in Newark some time ago. And she got saved. I used to fly. I used to fly into Chicago. You folks know that here. I, I, I used to fly down there every Sunday morning to preach. And then fly back to the revival Sunday night. Did it all the time. I got a million miles logged with United Airlines. I got two plaques in my office. Two million miles. I've flown every week. All over this country. Around the world. And I want you to know the devil is busy. This little woman came in and got saved. And the next Sunday I went back there in the morning and she stood up and she said, Oh, 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 oh Brother Shannon. Oh, that devil. He's been hounding me all week. I said, Welcome to the family, girl. You know, when people see you going through trouble, they think you're backslidden. They think you're running out on your wife, going with somebody else. Come on, don't look at me like that. Say amen. amen. They'll accuse you of all different things because you've gone through all that trouble. Oh, the Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord's going to deliver him out of them all. Hallelujah. The devil's putting all that trouble on you because he knows the anointing's on you. I said to that little woman, stand up, girl. I said, welcome to the family. She said, but I can't understand this. She said, I've been in the church 30 years and the devil never bothered me. I come out here last Sunday and got saved and all hell broke loose. I said, you just answered your own question. You can belong to a church. But if you're not saved, ain't no devil going to bother you. You're going to hell with him whether you know it or not. Have your name on every church book in Chicago. But when you're born again, washed in the blood of the Lamb, sanctified, holy, filled with the Holy Ghost and fire, I tell you, the devil will come out against you because the devil knows. God's getting ready to use What do you think God tried to kill that little brother? Sammy, what do you think God tried, that devil tried to kill you for? Oh, God's got to work for you to do something. That man on crack cocaine, stand up, brother. Oh, man, you died in your young age. And then the devil hooked you on drugs. He's out to kill you and destroy you, give you an overdose, but it's too late. <laughs> hey! I tell you, that makes me want to holler. You ain't going to stay in that no wheelchair. Devil put you in it. God's going to take you out of it, baby. Yeah, he will. He said, I am the Lord that healeth thee. I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. I know him as a healer tonight. I said, I know him as a healer tonight. I died on the operating table. Doctor said, I'd never live. I'd never preach. I didn't know I died. Everybody telling me about these near-death experiences, how they see a bright light. I didn't see nothing. I didn't know nothing. Didn't see no angels. Didn't see no devils. Didn't see nothing. I just dead, dead, brother. You know what I'm talking about. But God wasn't done with me. He spoke life into this young man's life. Can you shout amen? I just had, I just had my 70th birthday party. Are you listening to me? Somebody said, well, you, you, you live what the Bible said. No, David said that. Man's days shall be 70 years. But God said in the book of Genesis, man's days shall be 120 years. Ha! Who are you going to believe? You going to believe David or you going to believe God? Hey! I'm going to believe God. You going to believe God, son? See, God's got a work for you to do. He put that cancer on. He put it on, but God's going to take it off. In the name of Jesus. You lost a lot of weight. He came out there to see me on channel 38 when I was there. You're down to 100 pounds. How much did you used to weigh? 
155. Lost 55 pounds. See, the devil's sapping his life from me. I want you to know God's going to heal you. I said, God's going to heal you. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, you were healed. You were healed. You were healed. The devil is a liar. I was healed. Hallelujah. Turn around and look at somebody and say, I was healed. And I am healed. I was and I am. I'm talking about a God. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. I can tell I ain't going to get done with this one either. I'm reading from the 14th chapter of Joshua. And I'm using verse number 10 as a text. And now behold, the Lord hath kept me alive. As he said, as he said, not as the doctor said, as he said. Not what the hospital said, but what he said. He has kept me alive. These 45 years... Even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. Eighty-five. They've crossed over into the land. The land's already been distributed. And now Caleb is eyeballing Joshua. He says, you ain't giving me nothing. He said, God promised me this 45 years ago. What you want, Caleb? You see that mountain? I walked around that thing 45 years ago. I laid some footprints down. Now, therefore, give me this mountain. This is a life, Caleb. This is a life that is built on the promises of God. God said it. God gave him this promise and he's linking to it. Now, five times in this chapter, you can pick it out yourself. He said, the Lord said. The Lord spoke. Once he unites it with jo- with Joshua. Joshua, you remember when the Lord spoke? And then four more times, he takes it all to himself. He said, the Lord talking to me now. Are you listening to me? This is faith that's translated into everyday terminology for me. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world. He so loved who? The world. The world. Yeah, you can say that, but He loved me. Yeah. Say, but He died for the world. I know it, but He died for Shamba. Yeah. He carried stripes on His back for me. Yeah. He was wounded for me. He died for me. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But it's no longer I that liveth, but it's Christ that liveth within me. He died for me. He was buried for me. When he was buried, Shambach was buried with him. But the grave couldn't hold him. And when he come out of that grave, guess who come out with him? Shamba came out. Everybody say, I came out. My God, we live now because Christ lives. The author of life. Caleb learned this for himself. I said he learned it for himself. 
This word was in his heart for 45 long years. He lived it. He believed it. He confessed it. He thought it. He dreamed about it. All he went through, those children of Israel suffered in the wilderness for 40 years. Are you listening to me? When that world suffers, it's a long time of pain. There are tears that's measured in pain. But I want you to know the calendar of faith for the child of God, for you and for me. You know what it is? Weeping endures for the night. But joy is coming in the morning. Hey! What am I trying to tell you? I, you've been going through all this hell, but it's just about over. That's why we have services like this, so you can shout a little bit. Get ready to praise the Lord, because your victory's on the way. Joy is coming in the morning. God's putting your home back together again. You're going to get a brand new report from the medical profession. You might have lost your job, but God's getting ready to give you a new job. Go make more money. Are you listening to me? Working less hours. He's going to make you the head and not the tail. He's going to bless you going in. He's going to bless you coming out. He's going to bless your store and your basket. He's going to bless the fruit of your womb. He's going to bless your seed. Can you shout amen? Everything you set your hands to. He said, I will bless it. You shall be above and not, uh, not beneath. You ready for this one? You shall lend and not borrow. You shall lend and not borrow. You know what that means? God's going to get you out of debt. Hallelujah. He's going to bless you. Turn around, look at somebody and say, I'm going to lend and not borrow. Come on, that's, that's it, confess it. I'm going to lend and not borrow. Glory! I said glory! You know what Clay, Caleb clinged to? These two things. God said, I'm going to prolong your life. And you shall possess the territory. And I'll tell you, one of them fed the fire of the other. I'm going to give you long life, and you're going to possess the land. Oh, hallelujah. I'll never forget. I wish I had time to tell it. When I got that first church in Newark, New Jersey, I was preaching. When God said to Joshua in the first chapter, every bit of ground that the soles of your feet tread on, you shall possess it. I didn't know I was preaching to me. I was renting this building. I rented it, having revival meetings. But I claimed it. I said to my men working with me, come with me. I'm going to walk around the building. They said, we'll wait in the car. You walk around it yourself. See, they think you're crazy when you believe God. You're going to have to trust God all by yourself. Don't look for no prayer partner. They think you're crazy anyway. You've got to learn how to trust God for yourself. And I walked around that building and laid claim to it. And the next morning there was a for sale sign right on the lawn of that thing. And God gave me that building. Preacher called me after that and he said, Hey, Brother Shabbat, I'm over here in New Jersey in a certain town. He said, There's a building over here. I want you to come and walk around it for me. And he's on the phone. You know what I told him? Oh, I said, Brother, remember this. If I use my feet, it's going to be my building. He never even hung up the phone. He said, stay where you are. My God don't come over. And he went and ran around that building. I want you to know you can claim it for yourself. You can claim the victory. You can claim your family. You can claim your household. You can claim your miracle. Don't give in to the devil one inch. Give me this mountain. It may be a mountain, but God's going to give you the mountain. He's going to level it on the lower ground because of your faith in Him. I'm just as strong today as I was 45 years ago. I've got the new strength of God in my life. Hallelujah! 
Are you ready for your miracle? I feel like going devil hunting. My, 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 my. That's why I love this man, Caleb. 85 years old. Some of these young bucks are asking me, when are you going to retire? I said, I just bought four new tires. That's the only retire a preacher knows. Old preachers never die. They just blaze away. Come on, shout amen. I'm talking about the fire of God. Remember old John, old John Douglas used to work with us when I was with Alan. He, he said to me, he said, Samba, he, he said, I, I settled down. He said, uh, he says, you, you, you're full of life and vigor. And I said, you didn't settle down, you dried up, John. <laughs> everybody's, everybody's talking about you because you make noise and you got life in you. But I want you to know you got life in you. You got Jesus on the inside of you. You don't have death, you got life. Greater is He that is in me than He that is in that world. Can you shout Amen? Hallelujah! I said hallelujah! You little ladies coming around here with them canes, get ready to get rid of them. You on those, you, you on those, uh, little walkers, get ready to get rid of them. You in these wheelchairs, get ready to come out of them. Come on, shout amen with me, somebody. Hallelujah. You that are coming on crutches, get ready to get rid of them. You're going out of here a new man. You're going out a brand new woman. You're a child of God. God's going to bless you. Hallelujah. About an hour ago, you told somebody, you're going to get a miracle? Turn around and tell them, say, no, you ain't. I'm getting a miracle tonight. You gotta claim, you gotta claim this for yourself. Tonight's my night. I'm gonna get the miracle tonight. I said, I'm gonna get the miracle. Hallelujah! Now I appreciate that light up there, brother, but turn that thing off. You're bothering me. Save some electricity. Thank you, brother. Oh, thank the Lord. I can see. I can see. I don't need no spotlight on me. I'm trying to put the spotlight on Jesus. <laughs> hey! No offense, brother. Thank you. I know. I appreciate it. But I, I just like to have, have it off. If I was televising, I'd use that thing. I'm reading from the 14th chapter of Joshua. I told you I ain't never going to get out of this. <laughs> Joshua chapter 14, and I've been reading verse number 10. Let me read it to you again. And now behold, this is Caleb talking. Behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years. Even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. I'm 85. As yet, now if you just turned that radio on, I'm not 85. I'm reading by Caleb now, not Shamba. <laughs> and he said, as yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me, as my strength was, as my, my strength now, as my strength was then, so even is my strength now for warfare, both to go out and to come back in again. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Caleb had a walk of faith. It wasn't pumped up with an organ or a tambourine, but faith is a daily walk. 
45 years ago he was talking about. Now listen, this will encourage you. Moses sent 12 men out into that promised land to spy it out. To see whether or not it was a good land. I don't know why he sent them spies out. Now God ain't going to give you nothing that ain't good. But this is the way man is. Man likes to feel something. Man likes to look at something. We govern our faith by what we feel, the senses. What we hear, what we see, what we smell, what we taste, and what we feel. You ain't going to believe it unless you can see it. God said you ain't never going to see it. You've got to believe it before you can see it. That's where faith comes in. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You still don't know what faith is when you read that. That's not a definition of faith. I have a good definition. I call it the ABC. Faith is an action, A, based upon a belief. I believe it. Supported by confidence, A, B, C. An action, I provide the action. I have a belief in the Word of God. And I have confidence in what God said, that He'll do it. And He's got to do it. Can you shout Amen? Now, Moses sent a man out from every tribe of Israel. Twelve of them went out. And ten of them came back intimidated. They saw the giants. Now, Caleb had a different story. He and Joshua came back. They come back last. You know why they come back last? Caleb was walking around Hebron. He wanted to find out where the giants lived. Because he knew they had the best part. You know, if you're that big, you're going to have the best. And they had the best part of the land. And oh, oh, Caleb, he laid some footprints down. He heard God say, every bit of ground that the soles of your feet tread on, you're going to possess it. So he walked around the thing. 45 years ago, brother. Now, he brought 2.3 million people out of bondage and out of captivity, but only two went in. Well, that'll blow your mind, won't it? Joshua and Caleb were the only two that went in. You can't get in that land. That's a land of faith. Now, that ain't heaven. I've heard preachers say that Canaan land is heaven. It's a sign. No, there ain't going to be no sin in heaven. There was sin in that land. That land is what God wants you to inherit while you're here. What he's saying, you don't have to get to heaven to get it, but you can have a little bit of heaven right here. You can get saved here. You can get healed here. You can be blessed here. You can prosper here. And you can get filled here. And Caleb and Joshua were the only two that made it into the promised land. Why? Because they're the only two that came back with a good report. I ain't got no bad reports to give you. There's a lot of bad news coming from the pulpit. I ain't got no bad news. All I have is good news. You don't have to die. You don't have to go to hell. You can make heaven your home. You don't have to die with a cancer. You don't have to be sick, diseased, or afflicted. Are you listening to me? Do you know that Jesus in his day, he spent his time with the sinners? Church folks won't do that. We're too holy. We're going to have our own little society in the church. The poor gladly receive Jesus. Now, we don't want no poor folks around us. But you know, the the poor gladly received him. And he spent three-fourths of his ministry touching sick folks. Now this is a category of people he ministered to. Sinners, sick, and poor. The sinners didn't stay sinners when he got done with them. And the poor didn't stay poor. They became rich in faith. 
And the sick didn't stay sick. They got healed. When he said, rise, take up your bed and walk. He put his hands on them and they were healed. Can you shout amen? amen? Remember when the widow of Nain was coming out of her city, Nain? She had a son, her only son, that was dead. She was a widow. Her husband already died. And she was coming out with a procession of death. And Jesus was coming into the city with a procession of life. Life meeting death head on. You know who won that battle? That woman never asked for anything. She didn't have no faith. She didn't even know it was Jesus. She was buried in grief. She was sorrowful. But Jesus talked to the woman and said, Woman, weep not. When he tells you not to weep, he's going to take away the occasion for weeping. She's weeping because she's bearing a son. So what's he do? He reaches out and touches the casket. And when he touches the casket, he speaks to the dead boy and said, I say unto thee, Arise! That boy didn't have a lick of sense, but sit up. He come back to life. Jesus reached down to the regions of the dead and the damned, and he called that boy out from the grave. Are you listening to me? He was dead. Death is not just an unconsciousness of the brain. But Jesus called him by name and life came back. Hallelujah. The touch. The touch destroys the yoke. But his voice gave life. I'm going to do that to you tonight. I'm going to touch you with my hands under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to speak to that cancer and command it to die. I'm going to man, command sugar diabetes to vanish. That crippling devil to loose you. I'm going to come against AIDS in the name of Jesus. That HIV virus got to go because greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. He called us to do his works. Can you raise your hands and shout praise the Lord. You know I found the cure for AIDS? I found the cure. I went into the South Bronx with that tent. Drug addicts, they share needles. Drug addicts share. Christians don't. I had to get that lick in. Drug addicts share needles and the HIV virus contracted. And it comes in until it's full-blown AIDS. And they have no cure for it. It's a virus. Doctors have never found a cure for a virus. The common cold is a virus. And that cold's been around ever since it's been a man. Or a woman. They ain't got no cure for colds. And they ain't going to find no cure for AIDS. But I found the cure. You hear me, Mr. President? I found the cure. I don't care how much money you spend on AIDS research, you ain't going to find no cure. I found the cure. And the cure is in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I laid hands on this drug addict, former drug addict young man in, in, the, in, in the Bronx. I didn't know he had AIDS. I had an AIDS night. And I laid hands on I don't know how many AIDS victims. And I asked God, this is how I prayed. I said, give them a blood transfusion from Calvary. Clean up the blood straight. That young lad sat on the front row of that tent meeting every day until the last week I saw him get up. He had wore dark glasses. Trying to hide. You can't hide. On the front row, wearing dark glasses. And I called him up and laid hands on him. I embraced him. You know, when AIDS first came out, everybody was steering away from him. Don't breathe on me. I might get it. People were scared to death of it. I threw my arms around him. I hugged him. I prayed. Told him I loved him. In the name of Jesus. And the next week, the 
middle of my sermon, he got up in the, he got up in the service. And he went out. I wonder, where's he going? He ain't never done that before. And I didn't know until the next night. And he come back, he said, give me that microphone. I got to testify. I said, I ain't giving you no microphone. I'll hold it for you. I don't give this microphone to folks. And he told a story. He said, I, I got deathly sick last night in the service. I said, deathly sick? Man, you're dying on your feet. You got AIDS. Now, isn't that strange? Some people, they live so long with their sickness that if there's a difference, they think they're getting sick. You're already sick. You're dying, and there was a change. And you know what he did? He got up, and, and God had his hand on the whole thing. He went down, checked himself in the hospital where he generally does, and nurses know him by first name basis. They took all of his readings. They took uh, all the, the liquids, the urine tests, took blood from him, and they put him in a room. He's laying there in the bed going, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying. And they called the doctor, and the doctor comes in and checks all his vitals. Nurses give him the sheet. He gets to the blood. He said, are you sure this come out of him? Yeah, that's his blood. Can't be. Take another one. Took more blood from him. That doctor went into his room. He says, where you been? He said, I'm dying. He said, no, you ain't dying. You strong as an ox, man. He said, I want to know where you been. He said, I just checked your blood twice, and there's no sign of the HIV virus in your blood. Hey! That young man jumped up on that bed like a man in a Toyota commercial. He said, the man of God laid hands on me and asked God to give me a blood transfusion. God healed me of AIDS. You know, he went out on the streets of the South Bronx and grabbed everybody that had AIDS and brought them under that tent. He almost wore me out. I said, brother, heal them yourself. God healed you so you can heal somebody else. God saves you so you can save somebody else. He fills you with the Holy Ghost so you can get somebody else filled. Thank God for His touch. Can you shout amen? Can you give me about five more minutes? Take ten, all right? I tell you folks, I, I get beside myself when I come out here. And I've been reading from this 14th chapter of Joshua. This is one of my favorite books because Joshua moved into the promised land. And he got everything. A new generation. The old generation was done away with. They ain't had no faith at all. It's only the faith people that move in. I've been reading from this 10th verse. And now behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five. I'm eighty-five years of age, and as yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me, as my strength was then. Even so is my strength now for war. That's the part I want to get to. Both to go out and to come in. Here's a man of God that discovered the secret of perpetual youth. People telling me how young I look. I got my youth renewed. I said, I got my youth renewed. My wife and I were sitting in Brother Copeland's meeting in Fort Worth. When he stopped preaching, he said, Brother and Sister Shambach, stand up. I just got a message from God for you and your wife. God said he's going to take ten years of wear and tear off your body. My God, I ran around that building shouting victory. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. It works. 
There's something about Christianity, the inspiration that it gives and it imparts to every one of us. It gives us a stimuli and a hope that it permits us to cherish and to keep us alive even in our old age. Hallelujah. All the best characteristics of youth is manifested here in Caleb. And you and I can have that same thing. The fountain of youth is no fable, but it's a fact. And you know where it rises from? From right beneath the threshold of the temple of God. There's a stream coming out. A stream of water. It's the Holy Ghost. There's something about the Holy Ghost that keeps you alive. The very thing that some preachers preach against is the power of Pentecost. I don't mind telling you I'm Pentecostal. From the crown of my head to the soles of my feet to my fingertips. Every hair on my head is Pentecostal. And if it wasn't, I'd yank it out. I talk in tongues. I'm not ashamed to let you know that. Hallelujah. Jesus told his disciples when he got out of that grave, he said, go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. Sure, you shall receive power after, not before, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea, all Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. And he said, in these signs shall follow them but believers. How many believers do I have here? He said, in these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name you shall cast out devils. If you eat or drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt you. In my name you can take up serpents. That doesn't mean handle rattlesnakes. Don't hand me no rattlesnake. He's talking about you can handle that old serpent, the devil, and put him where he belongs. And you shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Hallelujah. You don't realize what you possess. You've changed the name of Pentecost to protect the guilty. We call ourselves charismatics today. I heard Walter Cronkite say one time, Glossalia, using the Greek terminology. I said, talk in English, man. Tongue talkers, that's what we are. We talk in tongues. We're full of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I'm not ashamed. Do you know what we've done in the church? We've taken the tongue talking out of the sanctuary. No more talking in tongues in the sanctuary. We're going to put it in the prayer room. Because we don't want to offend people. Well, I do. If talking in tongues is going to offend you, then you need to be offended. This is what it's all about. God said, I'm going to give you power over all the power of the devil. Can you shout amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I wish I could hang around here a while and anoint you all with oil. Something about oil I like. And a little dab ain't going to do you. Sometimes I anoint the head of people. I anoint their hands. I anoint their feet. Sometimes I make them take the shoes off. I, I oil, put oil on the feet. One lady wanted me to anoint her tongue. I said, I ain't got that much oil. That could be a man too, you know what I mean? <laughs> I know, I don't mean to offend you, lady. That could be a man also. <laughs> Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Oil! Something about it, folks. I put a bottle of oil in a young man's hand in Newark, the whole church, and I said, go find somebody that's sick. 
You know what he did? Went into the hospital. He didn't have no ministerial papers. No exhorters permit. He's going in the hospital. He didn't know to check in with the chaplain. He's just doing what the, what the preacher told him. And he started on the top floor and anointed everybody with oil. Went into every room, every ward. But he just didn't pray. He yanked him out of bed and said, go on home now, you're healed. He cleaned off the top floor. I want you young folks to hear this now. This will bless you. He cleaned off the top floor. Can you imagine him going out in their, in their nightgown? With a coat on, with their slippers. And they're coming off the elevator and they're going out there. And the nurse saying, where are you going? He said, that doctor said we're healed and told us to go on home. thought it was a doctor. He's a man of God. I'm talking about a young man that cleaned the top floor off and then went down to the next floor and started laying hands on people. If I had a group of young people like that in the church, we'd take Chicago over. Can you shout amen? I believe we're living in the day. We're going to empty the hospitals. They're going to bring dead bodies into our meeting. We're going to see the dead raised. God said heal the sick. Cast out devils and raise the dead. Now, you know, the church got that thing backwards. You know what the church is doing? They're praying over the dead. They're casting out the sick. And they're raising the devil. I believe it's about time we reverse that thing and get it in its biblical order and heal the sick and cast out devils and raise the dead. This is the final harvest. Jesus is about to come there's a work to do, and He's called you to do it. You're a believer, and these signs shall follow them that believe. Raise your hands and shout hallelujah. Are you a believer? You ready to put this to work? Oh, hallelujah. My ever God, I'm ever glad God healed me. So I can preach. You ain't going to preach no more. They said, well, if you do preach, you'll have to sit down and preach. Can you imagine me sitting down to preach? Something about that anointing when it comes on. Hallelujah. That anointing abides with you. You don't work it up. It abides with you. You can put it to work in the church. You can put it to work at home. You can put it to work in the hospital. You can put it to work on the street corner. Hallelujah. While we're here these two nights, we're going to ask God to empower you and anoint you in this last day and use you for His glory. But you got to get saved first. I love miracles. I love to see people healed and delivered and set free. I had a lady in New York told me, she said, pray for my son that God will fill him with the Holy Ghost and save him. I said, if God does it in that order, your son's going to blow up. Because you can't put new wine in old wine skin. You got to get a new bottle. You got to get a new vessel. You must be born again before you can hold the new wine of the Holy Ghost. Can you shout amen? I ain't talking about joining no church or shaking a preacher's hand. Signing your name on some church book. Might as well put your name on a barn door and shake a donkey's tail. Get you into heaven just as quick. You must be born. In this 14th chapter of Joshua, if you'll turn in your Bible, let me read it. Just listen carefully as I read it. Just highlight some of it. In the 6th verse of this 14th chapter of Joshua, this is what it declares. Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb 
Caleb the son Caleb the son of Jephuna. I'm glad mom named me Bob. Some of these Old Testament names. Caleb the son of Jephuna, the Kenezite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. That was at the borders of the promised land where they met. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me, brethren, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt but I wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, and that word swear doesn't mean the same as it means today when people swear and take the name of the Lord in vain. It means he was speaking with authority, like a judge with a robe on. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, wholly followed the Lord my God. And now behold, the Lord have kept me alive. Now, that's my text right there. I'm going to deal with that phrase. The Lord hath kept me alive. I'm going to shout it loud. The Lord hath kept me alive. As he said, these forty and five years, Even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five, I'm eighty-five years old. Do I have any eighty-five-year-old folks here tonight? Not a one. Where? Stand up. Ninety-three. You are just ripe for God to use. Now, I'm going to try to encourage you. Listen to this as I read this further. This is Caleb talking. As yet, I am as strong this day. Eighty-five? I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. And as my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war. He's not looking for a lazy boy. He's looking for a fight. He's looking for a battle. He's looking for an enemy somewhere. For war. I'm as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war both to go out and come back. In other words, I'm going to win the fight and come back shouting. 
Man, I love that kind of talk, don't you? Hallelujah. Now, therefore, give me this mountain whereof the Lord spake in that day, for thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there, and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him. Now Joshua was in his 90s. These were the only two young men in the gang. Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, Hebron, for an inheritance. And Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, unto this day, because that he wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, followed the Lord God of Israel. Hallelujah. Well, let me read the last verse. And the name of Hebron became Kerjath Arba, which Arba was a great man among the Anakims, and the land had rest from war, all because an 85-year-old man wanted to whip the devil. Isn't that beautiful? Bow your hearts. Father, let the anointing of the Holy Spirit come upon your servant tonight. Hiding behind the cross, let us see no man save Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that that our ears shall be open to truth tonight. Let us become doers of the Word. Don't let a soul leave here disappointed, but Lord, let them leave knowing that they have received what they've come for. Let faith come alive in every one of our hearts. Destroy fear, doubt, and unbelief. And let faith have her perfect work. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody shouted, Amen. Amen. And amen. I am reading as a text from verse number 10, this little phrase, And now behold, the Lord hath kept me alive. Now, I can quote that along with Caleb because this is my testimony as well, that God hath kept me alive. And I can say this along with every one of you that are here within the sound of my voice. You that are listening to radio, it was the Lord that hath kept you alive. And if it were not for the grace of God, you'd have been dead a long time ago. Many of you have had close calls with death. Some of you, you just got out of that drug culture in time before the devil killed you. And he set you free and put your feet on a solid rock. Can you shout amen? Just for my own benefit. How many of you used to be hooked on drugs and God set you free? Stand up, will you? I want to get a, get a look at you. I, I wish this was television so you could see all these people that used to be hooked on drugs, bound by the devil, and now they are free at last. And it's only God that has kept you alive. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a big hand clap, everybody. I wish you that are listening to this radio broadcast could see this sight of every one of these people that have been liberated and set free. And the testimony of God is, The Lord hath kept me alive! How many of you used to be bound with alcohol? You stand up. Let me see you. Any kind of booze. Moonshine. Look at all this group standing. And now you're preaching the gospel. You were a mess, but God picked you up. The Lord has kept me alive. Hallelujah. Oh, what a remarkable testimony this is. Sit down. 
How many of you used to be hooked on tobacco? And you're set free. Stand up. I, I can stand up with that one when I was a young lad. Isn't this great? You mean God set you free from it? The Lord hath kept you alive. You used to smoke. You'd have died with lung disease. But God set you free. Hey! Sit down. Well, now, how many of you used to be hooked on sin and now God set you free and washed you in the blood? Stand to your feet. What a beautiful sight. Hallelujah! All right. Now I got you all awake. Shout it out loud. The Lord Lord hath kept me alive. Say it again. The Lord has kept me alive. Woo! Hallelujah! Now there's a lot of young people that are mixed in the audience that stood up. And I don't care how young you are, and I don't care how old you are, the Lord has kept you alive. For the very fact He got you out of sin. Not only did He get you out of sin, but He got the sin out of you. He pulled you out of the mess, and then He worked on you and got the mess out of you. He sanctified you and made you holy, and then filled you with the Holy Ghost and fire, and quickened your spirit. And now, life is beating within your breast. You are a child of God. Raise your hands and shout, Amen, somebody. Hallelujah! Caleb had a life that was built on the promises of God. Every promise in that book. And he's talking, first of all, to a man by the name of Joshua. And he attributes a portion of this to Joshua. And he says, I think it's four times, five times altogether. He said, the Lord spake. Four times he attributes it to himself. And the one time, he says, Joshua, to you and me, God made a promise to us, and He said, every bit of ground that the soles of your feet tread upon, you shall possess it. They were one of the twelve spies that were sent out to spy out the land. Ten of of them came back with an evil report that turned the hearts of the people, but only two of them came back with a good report. These were men of faith. And they not only come back with the report, but they carried staves on their shoulder and they brought back the fruit of the land. Can you shout amen? They brought back the figs, which is representative of healing. They brought back the pomegranates, which was representative of the gifts of the Spirit. They brought back a jug of milk and a bucket of honey. And they said it's a land that flows with milk and honey. And we're able to go up and possess the country. The giants are there to hinder our way. But God said that we are going to take it. And He'll never leave us alone. But He's going to go by our side. And we're going to conquer. And we're going in. And we're going to lay claim to our inheritance. People hear me. Make up your mind you're going to have everything in that book. If God said it, it belongs to you. That promised land is not heaven. That promised land is representative of you here on this earth. There was sin in that land, but there ain't going to be no sin in heaven. God has a full inheritance for you. You don't have to wait until you get to heaven to get it, but you can have it right here in Oklahoma. You can have it in Texas. You can lay claim to the promise of God. He said every bit of ground that the soles of your feet tread on, you shall possess it. But you've got to live in the realm of the promise of God that if He said it, He'll do it. And if He spoke it, He's going to bring it to pass. Can you shout praise the Lord? Lord. Caleb believed God. Now I'm going to go over this a little, a little fast if you don't mind. But it's a life that we can look back to. This man called Caleb, ten spies, came back intimidated by the devil. Don't you ever let the devil intimidate you. He's already been defeated. All he can do is growl. 
Your elder brother pulled his teeth on Calvary 2,000 years ago. I've had preachers come to me and say, Don't you know how powerful the devil is? I said, I sure don't. All I know is my elder brother whipped him 2,000 years ago. Put a foot on his neck. Rendered him powerless and helpless. Then he turned around me to me and gave me power over all the power of the devil. He said, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Every one of you Baptists, keep this radio on. I want you to know you're a Baptist, but God wants to fill you with the Holy Ghost and fire. You Baptists believe in the water, but you get some of this fire and it's going to create steam. And it's going to put you on the move where you can heal the sick and to cast out devil because these signs shall follow them that believe. Can you raise your hands and shout praise the Lord? The Lord hath kept me alive. Oh, hallelujah. I said hallelujah. When those ten came back, they made the mistake of comparing themselves to the enemy. You don't compare yourself to no enemy. You compare the enemy with God. He's the one that fights the battles for you. He said you don't have to fight in this battle. Just stand still and see the salvation of the Lord with you. Hallelujah. 2,000 years ago, He destroyed Him. And it's up to you and me to keep our foot on His neck. That devil ain't got no business on your back. He got no business in your chest. He has no business in your head. He has no business in your legs or in your feet. That devil ain't got no business in your husband or your wife or your sons or your daughters. There's only one place the devil has any right to be, and that's under your feet. He is a defeated foe, and God's given you power over all the power of the devil. Oh, hallelujah! Raise your hands and shout hallelujah with me. Hallelujah! I dare you to turn around and tell somebody, i got more power than the devil. I dare you. I've got more power than the devil. Say it there in your home. I've got more power than the devil. My, my, my. Now, I was going to be dignified tonight. Now I'm getting to feel this thing. You preachers ever feel this when you're preaching? You know what I'm talking about. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. There was a time when I used to stand behind the pulpit and preach. Like a six foot icicle. <laughs> Homiletically, I preached perfect. After ten minutes, I'd step to the side for a diversion. You can tell I was taught homiletics. Then I'd come back. Ten minutes later, I'd come out on the other side for about 30 seconds and then go back. Nobody was allowed to shout. Are you listening to me? Then one day, God delivered me and set me free. Sometimes I don't hang around the pulpit. I get in the aisle and run. Did you ever feel this, that you can't stand still? You just got to let the Holy Ghost have His way. Hallelujah! The Lord hath kept me alive. I said the Lord hath kept me alive. Fourteenth chapter of Joshua, verse 10. That phrase is right here couched in this verse. Caleb talking. The Lord! Hath kept me alive. Eighty-five years of age. Joshua, I think, was about ninety-seven, if I'm not mistaken, or ninety-five, give or take a few. It don't matter when you're that old. <laughs> Just give or take a few. 
And here these were the two oldest men in the group. The rest were kids. Young folks around 40. Just kids. And it's the old folks that's going to show them how to conquer devils. I said it's the old folks that's going to show them how to conquer that devil. Come on, some of you old folks got gray hair on your head. You know, and some of you ain't got no hair on your head. You're the ones I'm talking to. We're going to show the younger generation how to do this thing. You've learned more than just a sitting in a pew somewhere and keeping it warm, but you've got to get up out of that pew and stretch out on God's Word and do what He called you to do. Can you shout Amen? I've had preachers ask me, when are you going to retire? I said, I just bought four brand new tires. That's the only retire I know. General Douglas MacArthur, you know what he said? Old soldiers never die. They just fade away. Well, I got a new saying. Old preachers never die. They just blaze away. They stay on fire. Can you shout amen? The Lord hath kept me alive all of these years. You know what I find? Oh, Caleb... He discovered something. He discovered the fountain of youth. I'll tell you, when you get to know God like Caleb did, you're going to discover something, the perpetual youth. You know what he said? And I love this. Keep your Bible open to this. He said, I am as strong this day as I was. 45 years ago when Moses sent me out as a spy just as strong today oh hallelujah my daughter Donna I mean she's telling me dad take it easy now I said I ain't taking nothing easy I come too far to take it easy I wear out these young folks even land singing all these young folks around me, and they can't take it like I can take it. You know what? I got healed. I got delivered. I get set free. The Lord has kept me alive. Turn around and look at somebody and say, The Lord has kept me alive. Come on, say it out loud. You that are listening to this broadcast, get out of that... Get out of that lazy boy chair. Some of you just get in there and stay in it all day long. 65 years old, you're looking for a retirement home. All kind of vitamin pills. Somebody said, you take any vitamin pills? I take four of them. Four pills. The Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Some of them vitamin pills are good for you, though. Thank God for the ones I found. But the best ones you can get are right there in that book. The Lord hath kept me alive. I said the Lord hath kept me alive. You know what it says in the Psalms? They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. Woo! Everybody over 40, holler hallelujah. hallelujah. They shall be full of sap and green the fountain of youth is no fable but it's a fact and you know where it comes from it rises from beneath the threshold of the temple of God where is the temple right here God Jesus said to his disciples out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water can you shout amen? That's the Holy Ghost coming out of your belly, not out of your head. Sometimes under my tent I see people out in the prayer tent trying to give folks the Holy Ghost. They say, repeat it after me. Say, dad, 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 dad. And I grab them by the back of the neck. And they say, Brother Shambach, listen, they talking in tongues. I say, ain't no talking in tongues. That's how I got my baby to learn how to talk. I'd tell him to say, Dad, Dad. And I'd say to my little boy, put him on my lap. Say, Dad, Dad. He'd say, Mama. I said, I didn't say Mama. I said, Dad, Dad. Mama, Mama, Mama. You don't have to have somebody whispering in your ear and telling you what to say. 
It doesn't come out of your head. It doesn't come out of your brain. But the Holy Ghost comes out from the threshold underneath the temple of God. This is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. In the book of Ezekiel, you'll find it recorded there. It starts out with a trickle. And then he gives it a measurement, and then it comes up to the ankles. And then he gives it another measurement, and it comes up to the knees. He gives it another measurement, and it comes up to waters you've got to swim in. This is what I'm talking about. Some of you are still playing church. The only time you raise your hand is when the preacher says, Everybody say amen. And you sit there and say, Amen. Everybody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And then you, in, underneath you're saying, I wish he'd stop that. I don't feel like praising no Lord. If he had to go through what I went through. And then you see people shouting and running and dancing. And then you point at them and say, I don't know why they got to make all that new noise. If they had to go through what I was going through, they wouldn't be shouting. They wouldn't be dancing. That's why they're shouting. Because they're going through trouble. Sorrow may endure for the night, but joy is coming in the morning. Can you shout amen? They're just practicing. They know the joy bells are about to ring. I'm not going to let the devil shut me up, but I'm going to shout hallelujah anyhow. And if I can't shout in the church, I'm going outside the church. I'll shout on the sidewalk. I'll go to the mountains and shout on the mountainside. I'll go to the seashore and I'll shout at the seashore. I've got something to holler about. What is it? The Lord hath kept me alive. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Turn to 1 John. I'm going to read something to you. 1 John, way back in the end of the book. 1 John chapter 5. Here we go. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we, have, when we love God and keep his commandments. Somebody say, keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. Hear it. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Are you born of God? Then you're not a victim. You are an overcomer. You're the victor. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Woo! Man, that makes me want to holler a little bit. Even our faith. This is the victory that overcomes the world. God never intended for you and me to be intimidated by the devil, but He called us to be overcomers. Can you shout amen? amen. Caleb was an overcomer. He moved into his full inheritance. God wants you to enjoy everything. That He's promised you in this book. The promises of God. Every one of them. What an example He is. Caleb. Ready for danger. And he's ready for enterprise. He's looking for a fight. He said, The Lord hath kept me alive as He has said for 45 long years. A man who is 85 years of age, he didn't join the Geritol set. He didn't join a retirement club. He didn't file for an old age benefit. But he asked for a mountain. He says, now therefore give me this mountain. He had that in his vision. He had it in his something out there in front of you. God's not going to let you die until you possess it and lay claim to the victory. Raise your hands and shout amen. Hallelujah. Now therefore give me this mountain. Oh, I love this. Who lives in them mountains? Giants. You know when God first called Caleb and Joshua and Moses declared this to those twelve men? 
Tell them that every bit of ground that the soles of their feet tread on, they shall possess it. You know where Caleb headed? He wanted to know where the giants lived. Because they knew they had the best ground. It was a mountain called Hebron. And he laid down them number 12 footprints around that city. Hallelujah. I'll never forget my first church. I was preaching that from the first chapter of Joshua. Every bit of ground that the soles of your feet tread. I couldn't wait till I got done preaching and laying hands on the folks because I was renting the building. And I was preaching it to me. And I said to the preacher friends, hey, walk with me. Where are you going? I said, I'm going to walk around the building. What for? I'm going to claim it. You know what they said? We'll wait in the car. Do it by yourself. <laughs> you know, when you start talking faith talk, they want to shut you up. They think your elevator don't go the whole way, whole way up. They think you're 20 cents short of a dollar because you're talking faith that God's going to do something for you. But you've got to stand alone on the Word of God. I've learned that thing a long time ago. Can you shout amen? amen? To make a long story short, God gave me that property. And I just have one regret. I wish I'd have walked around the whole block instead of the building. He walked around Hebron, the whole city. And now, 45 years later, while all of his buddies died off, he was the only man of faith, he and Joshua, and now he stands before Joshua. Everybody else is in their inheritance, and now Caleb's saying, Now therefore, give me this mountain! i got some footprints up there. You remember what God told Moses about you and me? That about every bit of ground that the soles of our feet tread on, we'll possess it. Now I want it. For 45 years I've been waiting. That's faith, folks. Some of us, if we don't get it right away, well, the Lord don't want me to have it, I guess. I've been in the prayer line twice, ain't never got nothing. I ain't never had nothing and never will, that lying devil. Jesus had to lay hands twice on a blind man. He laid hands on this blind man. Pop! What do you see? He said, I see men like trees walking. Jesus said, that ain't good enough. Bam! Now what do you see? I see everything clear. Woo! You know what I'm trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you, don't give up. I don't care how long it takes. Just keep on coming back. God has your miracle. But you've got to press your way. The Lord has kept you alive so that you can move into your full inheritance and don't give up until you get it. Raise your hands and shout praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm reading from this 14th chapter of Joshua. And I've been dealing with this for a long time. Behold, the Lord hath kept me alive. 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 What an example of a life that's looking for a fight. I love this, especially if it's an 85-year-old person. Looking for conflict. These words... now. Keep, keep your Bible open there because these words express thankfulness and praise. This is, this is not doubt. Let me go on down here. Now therefore give me this mountain whereof the Lord, the Lord spake in that day, for thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there, these are the giants, and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be, if so be, the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord hath said. This is not unbelief. This is thankfulness and praise. This is the grounds for the petition. Give me this mountain. This shows his humility and not doubt. His warrior's eyes begin to flash. His voice is strong and it's full. It's not a wavering voice. Nothing can stand before us. I don't care what kind of difficulties or dangers that confront you. 
If we cast ourselves into the conflict, remember this one thing, God is with us. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Victory marches by our side. Remember what I said earlier. We are the conqueror. We are not the ones that's intimidated by the devil. We are not, not the victims. We are the victors because of the faith of God that we possess. You say, but oh, you don't know how dangerous it is. It's an attraction to the generous mind. Here's a man that knew that giants lived in that city. A coward that looks for an easy place. Let others do the work. But here's an 85-year-old man that says, I'm going after him myself. No, not one of those young folks say, you stay here and you're lazy boy and let me go. Uh-uh. They were scared to death. Go ahead, brother. We'll pray for you. We'll, we'll have a 24-hour chain of prayer while you're gone. And if you get back. That's how they talk. If you get back. But not this 85-year-old man. He said, I'm just as strong today as I was 45 years ago for warfare. To go out and fight and then to come back victoriously. This is the kind of man that I desire to be. The Lord hath kept me alive for a purpose. And in my own life, I believe God kept me alive for this last day harvest. This ain't no time to hang up your harp on some tree. This is not some time to sit in upholstered pews, but it's time to get up and go out into the highways and the hedges and do what God called you to do. The miracle of this prolonged life was for special service. If I have any older people here like I am, listen to me. You know why God kept us alive? There's something special out there to accomplish. God, God's putting it in your hands to accomplish it. Because you've learned how to put this faith to work. Oh, hallelujah. Accept the challenge when it comes your way. Hallelujah. It's a fenced city. The giants are there. They're tall. He said, I ought to be there. Thank God that spirit's not dead yet. Most of our churches move out of the cities, out into the suburbs. They get away from the drug culture. But we put our tent up in the city, right where that devil is. Let him know we're not running. That devil ain't got no power. He was stripped of his power 2,000 years ago. Can you shout amen? He said, one of you shall chase a thousand, and two of you shall put ten thousand to flight. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. He asked God for a mountain. My God, give us faith like this. I was reading a story of Napoleon. Napoleon awarded the highest honor, the military honor of France, to one of his distinguished heroic officers. They call it the cross of, of war. The cross of war. The croix, they, in the French. The croix de guerre. Whatever that means. It means the cross of war. For distinguished honor beyond the call of duty to one of his officers. And Napoleon, now listen to this, Napoleon wishing to reward him. Do you know what he asked him? He said, whatever your request is, I will grant it. Do you know what that soldier said? To the amazement of his fellow officers, he said, I would like a nylon for my own. And do you know what Napoleon said? Napoleon said, I am honored by the magnitude of your request. You ask some people today, what do you want the Lord to do for you? Anything he wants to. I get tired of that. 
People come to me and say, Brother Shambach, I need $2,000 to pay this bill. Will you pray and ask God to give me $2,000? I say, I ain't going to do it. If we're going to pray, why don't we ask Him for five? Then you can give God three. All we want to do is ask God to pay our bills. Why don't you ask Him largely? Like this man says, I want an island for myself. And he says, you honor me by the magnitude of your request. Jesus on the main line. Tell him what you want. What do you want him to do for I, I tell you, I had a man come through my line. And he, he I, I get tired of hearing this. I said, what do you want God to do for you? Anything he wants. I thought, I'm going to fix him. I laid hands on him and I said, Lord, kill him. He ducked from under my... He said, I don't want him to kill me. I said, then what do you want? The Bible says you have not because you ask not. And then in our church in Philadelphia, Donna loves to hear me tell this story. There's a little lady over here by the altar praying, and she's just shouting it out in her own voice, a crying voice. You ever hear it? Please, Jesus. You ever hear that? Please. I'm trying to pray for folks. She's tearing me up. Please, Jesus. Please, Jesus. I went over there, put my microphone away, and I whispered in her ear. I said, change one word. You ain't no beggar. You don't have to say please to God. Change that word please and get rid of it and say thank you. Thank you, Jesus. And I walked away and she changed her song. She said, thank you, Jesus. Same old monotone. Thank you, Jesus. About four times. Thank you, Jesus. Fourth time around. Thank you. Hey! Thank you. Thank you. And she got up and started shouting and dancing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You ain't no beggar. You don't have to go around with your little old tin cup. Just begin to praise Him and say, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my husband. Thank you, Jesus, for delivering my son from drugs. Thank you, Lord, for setting my daughter free. Thank you. Learn how to thank Him. And when you begin to thank God, hear me, God can't stand all that praise. He'll send your answer on the way. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. It's time to give Him thanks. It's time to give Him praise. And when you learn how to do that, you are headed for the greatest victory of your life. Can you shout praise the Lord? Put up your hands and praise Him right there in your home where you are. I am honored by the magnitude of your request. Ask largely that your joy might be full. Oh, hallelujah. Well, I'm not done yet, but I'm going to quit. I'm thinking of these pastors now in the morning. No, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to come back and finish it. You ain't going to get rid of me. You don't mind if I come back, do you? There's so much involved here, folks. God wants you to be more than a conqueror. I was preaching at John Osteen's church down in Houston. You, you've seen John on television. Brother Osteen's a great man of God. And, and there was a young fellow preaching. And it was a conference, convention time. And he was preaching the day service, and I was sitting there listening to him. And he gave one of the greatest illustrations of what more than a conqueror is. Now, I'm happy just to be a conqueror. But God says you're more than a conqueror. And this young man had the greatest illustration. I wish I'd have thought of it. But I've got to give him credit for it. And he quoted it this way. He told the story. Two heavyweight fighters, 240 pounds, solid steel, Big old shoulders, narrow waist, like me. Oh. 
And he said they were fighting for a million dollar prize. Winner take all. Loser gets nothing. And they both signed the contract and it was a fight that lasted the distance. Nobody got knocked out, but somebody had to win. Somebody had to be the conqueror. And finally they took blows, received blows, gave blows, everybody, both of them. They were getting hit and they were throwing hits. They were great fighters. And the stamina, they went 15 rounds and only one emerged the victor. Only one emerged the conqueror. And they gave him his million dollar check. Here he had bruised eyes, puffed eyes. You could tell he went through a battle. And then he went home. This guy was six foot four. He went home to his little wife of five foot three and handed her the check. She's more than conquer. Amen. The husband took the blows, but she got the check. Isn't that a great story? And you know what? You know what? You know how you, you already got it applied. Jesus took the blows on Calvary. 2,000 years ago, he suffered, he bled, he died in order that you and I could be more than a conqueror. You and I don't have to fight the devil anymore. Jesus already whipped him. It's our job to keep him where he belongs, under our feet. Are you listening to me? And we are more than conquerors because we believe what was accomplished on Calvary 2,000 years ago. Now, if you're here tonight, and you're not saved. All you got to do is come to Him. Just as you are. You don't try to clean yourself up. That's His job. All you do is come as you are. Somebody said, what do I have to do? Nothing. That's the beauty of it. See, this is difficult for man. Man likes to be macho. He wants something to do. All you got to do is surrender. That's all. He's done it all. He said, he or she that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast him out. He wants participation. You initiate it by coming. He says, you confess, I forgive. That's the way it is. Just as you are. I don't care what kind of sins you've committed. Listen to me. The blood of Jesus will not cover them. He'll wash them away. And God won't remember what you used to be. The moment you come to Him, you are the righteousness of Christ. Isn't that beautiful? The greatest thrill to me is that God don't remember what I was. There's always people asking me, what did you used to do when you were a sinner? I said, none of your business. I'm trying to forget it. devil won't let me. But God forgot it, and that's all that matters. I am now the righteousness of Christ. And that's what he wants to do. Listen, I don't care how many times you try and fail. You've been listening to a failure tonight. I ran away from God. I joined the Navy. God called me to preach. I wouldn't preach. I had my life already planned out. I was going to be an FBI man. And that doesn't mean full-blooded Indian. I'm in Indian territory now. And I thought God was imposing. I didn't mind him saving me so I wouldn't go to hell. But he wanted me to preach. I said, I ain't going to do it. And I said, I'm going to show you I ain't going to do it. I went and joined the Navy. Got assigned to a ship. Never been out of the state of Pennsylvania. That's where I was born and raised. Took that ship, the Van Valkenburg, the 656. Took it on a shakedown cruise, they call it. Went to Bermuda. And I said, good, I'll be glad when I get out of here. Get away from that call of God. Guess what? When I got to Bermuda, he was there. <laughs> Went through the Panama locks. Guess what? He was there. Went around to San Diego. I knew he wasn't going to be in California. That's the land of the fruits and nuts. I knew he wasn't going to be out there. But guess what? He was there. Went to Pearl Harbor. He was there. 
Went to Wake Island. He was there. I went over to the Philippines. He was there. Went to Iwo Jima. I was in that, that invasion of Iwo Jima. They just celebrated. He was there. Went to Okinawa. He was there. When they dropped the atom bomb in Nagasaki and, and Hiroshima, I said, I know you ain't going to be there. We escorted hospital ships in to get out our troops that were held prisoner. Guess what? He was there. And right there on the docks of Sasebo, Sasebo Harbor, I said, I give up. I surrender, Lord. I ain't running no more. I'll preach. You know what I did? I made a pulpit out of a five-inch gun mount on that destroyer. I held services on that ship preaching to them drunken sailors. That's when you know you're called and you didn't just win. And I still get mail from some of them sailors who thank me for taking a stand for God. I lived that in that environment for three years and never tasted booze in my life. God kept me from it. He was preparing me for the ministry. Are you listening to me? I don't care how many times you tried and failed. You've been a failure like I am. I'll guarantee you he'll take you back. I don't care what you did. I don't care what kind of sin you've ever committed. I'll guarantee you. Listen, if he don't receive you, I'll quit serving him. Because I know he cannot lie. Every head bowed, every eye closed in prayer, please. If you're here tonight, you never made your peace with God. Listen to me. We're on the final wind-up. In Texas, they say round-up. This is it. The last the last one. Jesus is about to come. And he's coming back for the blood-washed church. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, maybe you've never had an experience. I'm not talking about joining a church. You can have your name on every church book in Oklahoma. Shake every preacher's hand and still go to hell. If you're here tonight, I'm talking about being born again. His Spirit will bear witness with your spirit that you've been received. All you've got to do is come. You want my prayer? I'm going to count to three. Just simply one, two, and three. Now, three will be your signal. When I start counting, you'll have 30 seconds to make your decision. When I say that, I'm done. Finished. Your opportunity will be over. Now, He wants a response out of you. You either accept Him or you're rejecting Him. You walk out of here tonight without making your peace with God, you are rejecting Him. Today is the day of salvation. You don't put this off till tomorrow. Now is the accepted time. He's dealing with you now. You want my prayer. You get your hand ready. Every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl. When I start counting, 30 seconds. Here's the first one. Counting down to eternity. Here it is. One. 25 seconds. Where will you spend eternity? It's your choice. It's your decision. Please hear me. God sends nobody to hell. We send ourselves by rejecting the only plan of salvation. Jesus is the only avenue of escape. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's the only way. And I'm happy to be the one to tell you Mohammed's not the way. Buddha is not the way. Hari Hari Krishna is not the way. Jesus said, I am am the way here's the second one here it is two twelve seconds to eternity where will you spend it every man every woman every boy every girl you want God to do a work in your life get your hand ready four seconds counting down here's your signal this is it all over the building the final service, here it is. This is your signal. Three all over the place. Put your hands up. I see your hands. I see young people with their hands up. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. In the balcony. Just hold patience with me. I gotta thank you. I see your hands up there in the balcony. Anybody else? Quickly, quickly, quickly. Now you that raised your hands, I want you to stand to your feet. I'm gonna pray for you right there where you are. I have no place for you to come, but I just want you to stand if you want Christ to come into your life.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Keep your heads bowed, everybody. Just keep your heads bowed for a moment. You that are standing, I want you to... I'm going to pray there, right there where you stand. Anybody else, quickly? Before I pray. You feel God touching your heart. That's it. Thank you. Anybody else? Before I pray. It's the final night. If you feel God touching your heart, please stand to your feet. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for all these that are standing. They're responding to the moving of your spirit. Satan, I command you in the name of Jesus to release your hold on their life. You can't have them anymore. Loose them and let them go. Then I turn around and bind that spirit so he can never attack you this way again. This is going to be your first day of eternal life. Jesus, do a work in their heart. Give them the assurance that they've passed from death to life. A miracle of God. Tonight, in Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. amen. Remain standing, will you? Just remain standing. Look at me. You that are seated, just keep, keep your heads bowed, if you will. I feel like I want you to do one more thing. When Jesus hung on that cross, he wasn't ashamed of you or me. His arms were outstretched, nails in his hands and his feet and a crown of thorns. He wasn't ashamed. I'm going to ask you. Now, God said, if you'll be ashamed of me, he said, I'll be ashamed of you, my Father in heaven. But he said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. Let the Lord know you're not ashamed. And slip into the nearest style and come down here and gather right around this, this altar right here, will you? Come from the balcony, if you will. I'll wait for you till you come. Sing while they come. That's it. Don't sit there.